I recently uploaded a video about the debate between creationism and evolution. So in this video, I would like to delve a little bit deeper into the processes of evolution, such as natural selection. From my understanding, the creationist viewpoint is largely based on the elegance and seemingly perfect nature of reality, and its explanation in the biblical story of Genesis, which can be found in the Old Testament. Aspects of nature which are incredibly complicated are deduced to intelligent design. Something I had mentioned in a previous video was a long discussion I had with a friend who attended my university as a biology major. She had subscribed to the theory of microevolution, as this is something which is unanimously accepted for the most part. However, macroevolution is where she tapped out. The concept of deep time and genetic mutations leading to exuberant variation and speciation is something which is unfathomable for many people. In reality, there is no definitive line between micro and macroevolution. Macroevolution is simply the same processes of microevolution, but observed over a much longer period of time. This is where, when juxtaposition across vast expanses of time is noted, one can observe the divergence of a species. We can observe macroevolution daily in insects, microorganisms, and even small animal species. In Richard Dawkins' book, The Greatest Show on Earth, he exemplifies the evolutionary process as such. Artificial selection is the process of artificially selecting genes which will be passed on to further generations. This is what humans have done with animals such as dogs for tens of thousands of years. We have also done this with plants, with horticulture, and agriculture for thousands of years as well. We've come to call this process breeding. We, consciously and sometimes unconsciously, select traits which are desirable and breed members of a species with the same traits, leaving out members with undesirable traits. Over time, the selected phenotype becomes ubiquitous. This is how we have an immense variety of dog breeds and fruits and vegetables which are unrecognizable when compared to their natural ancestors. Sexual selection is the process of animal species choosing to mate with members of a species which possess desirable traits. For example, a female peacock is attracted to the elaborate feather displays of a male peacock. These traits are the result of genetic mutations, and if they are favored by the female of the species, in this case a female peacock, the females will mate with the males with the most attractive display. This causes these traits to prevail in the gene pool. Peacocks born with genotypes for less elaborate displays are not favored by the females, and so their chance of reproduction and passing on these genes are low. Predator and prey selection. Take an anglerfish, for example. The prey of an anglerfish are attracted to the bioluminescent light attached to its head. This light is the result of genetic mutations and a symbiotic relationship with bioluminescent bacteria. The larger and brighter the light, the greater the attraction of the prey. Prey are unconsciously selecting these genes for their own preservation. If a particular anglerfish lacks luminance due to a genetic mutation, it will not attract prey. Because of this, it will starve and not live long enough to pass on its genes to further generations. Thus, the genes for more luminous anglers will be favored by the prey. Lastly, the environment. In the same exact manner as the former three examples, the environment unconsciously favors traits for survival. Take the evolution of early hominid species, for example. When the African forests disappeared into savannas during climate changes a few million years ago, hominid species were no longer able to fully live arboreally. Genetic mutations in these species, which included bipedalism, were favored in the savanna as there were fewer trees to climb. Bipedalism was a more efficient means of traversing distances and hunting. This is the environment selecting genes for preservation, which become more prevalent in a gene pool over time. This process can be applied to any trait of all species that have ever lived. One may try to make the claim that genetic mutations do not occur, but if this were to be the case, then we would have no variation as a species. We would all look and behave the same, but any observation of the natural world will show you that we do not live in biological homogeneity. Mutations occur daily. Another example worth mentioning is convergent evolution. 
where species which are not closely related evolve similar traits due to inhabiting similar environments. The evolution of a streamlined body with fins and fish, marine mammals, and ancient marine reptiles. The adaptation of echolocation in porpoises and bats. The evolution of eyes, which have appeared hundreds of times independently. Wings have evolved in birds, mammals, and even fish. There are countless examples of similar body shapes and traits which have evolved independently due to organisms inhabiting similar environments. When you examine the skeletal structures of all animals, you can observe anatomical similarities because we all share a common ancestor. The wing of a bat is simply a modified arm and hand. The fins of cetaceans and porpoises are also modified hands with skeletal fingers hidden deep inside. Manatees have toenails from their ancient feet. The laryngeal nerve of a giraffe, which is ridiculously stretched along its neck because natural selection cannot go back to the drawing board and start from scratch. Humans have tailbones, which are vestigial remnants of our ancestral tails. Every animal species on Earth shares a similar skeletal structure, just modified for different environments. The lines we draw between species could be considered arbitrary, but there are useful methods of categorizing the natural world in a way which is comprehensive. In reality, there are no lines between species, just vast expanses of time. Separatism viewed by juxtaposition is how we achieve the perception of species. We are all derived from a single common ancestor, just different variations of these first genes. Life on Earth has radiated across every corner of the planet and has adapted to thrive over billions of years. Evolution does not work as a ladder, but rather a tree of many branches. No species is more evolved than another. Each species is uniquely adapted to its environment because of genetic mutations which have gradually sculpted variation over time. The major constant of biology is change. Now, back to my friend from my university. She had ended our debate by stating, You will never convince me of evolution, as I will never convince you of creationism. To which I replied, That's where you're wrong. You could very well convince me of creationism if you had ample evidence to support it. From the perspective of many creationists, any sign of evolution, fossils, genetic testing, similar skeletal structures, Hox genes, convergent evolution, are all deceitful tricks of the devil. If this were to be true, then this would imply that the devil is in everything. Every fossil you can examine, every cell you can observe, and every organism you can dissect can be traced back to a single point in time. If we are to believe in the creationist story, then we are to believe that every aspect of the observable universe is a facade designed to deceive us by a malevolent force. This is no world in which I choose to believe. That is a devil's world. Not to mention the observations of astronomers for hundreds of years which have shown us how vast and old the universe is. The greatest minds to have ever existed besitted methodology of scientific scrutiny and observation. And cross-culturally, the conclusions they have drawn about the nature of reality remain the same. Millions of people across the span of time, from hundreds of nations around the world, have drawn the same conclusions about the natural world based on scientific observation. Science and fact are not concerned with beliefs. Though it does change in its methodology and practice, the objective observation of reality is not bound by belief in something which requires conviction which cannot be debated. It is open to change with new perspectives, unlike many systems of faith. Faith in science is the faith of the scientific method, and the pursuit of truth, a method that is the antithesis of blind faith in something which has no evidence. Whether or not there is some sort of divine drive behind these processes, a transcendental object at the end of time, pulling the evolutionary process toward communion or nirvana, I don't know. We're only privy to a minuscule fraction of reality, what exists beyond the veil of illusion is unknown. However, this does not mean that we should believe with conviction in something which has no evidence or practical application. The fact that anything is happening at all is beautiful and mystical in itself. We are experiencing only a microcosm of perhaps an endless array of fractal geometry which extends forever. The Euclidean and Newtonian world may only be a small sliver of the multiverse. That is a beautiful thing to ponder. Why the need for denying and ignoring amazing aspects of reality? There is so much wonder in the world, and the only reason we know anything about it is because of observation. To deny the evolutionary process and study is to deny observation. 
it is synonymous with taping one's eyes closed. Does the concept of evolution imply that there is no God? Not even slightly. No aspect of science denies the possibility of a God. Science is open to all new perspectives and will integrate new variables given there is ample evidence. This is the fundamental difference between faith and non-faith. Faith requires no proof for its conviction. Perhaps this is a human quality which has aided our species since our infancy, and it's certainly one which I find admirable, but it is at times an impediment to understanding new perspectives. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.